Uh, I was very surprised uh, by uh, your statement uh, because uh, my narrative, uh, if uh, that uh, two uh, disgrace uh, fell upon the people of Egypt, uh, and uh, you know, to, uh, if I understood you, to uh, uh, maybe you were uh, offering uh, this as a clear example of the challenge uh, confronting uh, democracy today. Anyhow, you know, just to be honest, uh, I was very surprised, uh, uh, and I have a lot of Egyptian friends uh, that actually would say the same thing and said the same thing. Uh, about Sisi, which I think, uh, is, in my opinion, is a dictator. Uh, and <laughs> not up to show you the different uh, narrative uh, and the challenge uh, of uh, democracy, but uh, I would think uh, that uh, one among uh, the many challenges of democracy is uh, to show clearly the benefits uh, which was the previous uh, uh, you know, session. Uh, because uh, <laughs> the democracy stinks, yes. But compared to dictatorship, uh, is the best thing that uh, up to now seems uh, we have been uh, created. And so it's uh, nice uh, to uh, underline the challenge confronting democracy. And uh, uh, I think uh, the challenge uh, confronting democracy, one of them, was put uh, uh, <laughs> to words in Dewey that uh, unfortunately uh, we in society, we have a, a social construction uh, in democracy the dictatorship is really a tragedy in my eyes, that they are politicians, uh, philosophers, uh, heroes, too many teachers, too many teachers, and very few promoters of learning. Uh, democracy, the, the challenge of democracy is instead of telling people what is reality, is to help them uh, to develop the critical thinking, mm -hmm. not telling them uh, what is the truth. Because uh, mm -hmm. that's, uh, I would say, a little counter uh, to democracy. I live in Italy, and uh, I, I was very negatively impressed uh, how much uh, the vote got, uh, you know, thrill people about their worst fear, but their fears based on lies, based on lie on the immigrants, based on lie of how uh, <laughs> prosperity is created. You know, and the people afraid of the changes, uh, you know, would they believe it? the most uh, incredible lies. It's not the first time in history, but the, one of the challenge of democracy is uh, how <laughs> to educate uh, people to not have democracy from above, but how to create a democratic uh, relationship uh, with their wives and their husband, uh, with their children, uh, with their co-workers. Otherwise, uh, democracy is uh, always something like uh, coming down from above, uh, you know, something given to somebody. Actually, I think uh, until then, uh, there's not going to be, <laughs> you know, truly democracy until we create. And it's better to say in this thing, and uh, what the Kakabo said is all true in my mind, but then uh, we need uh, that uh, a democracy is really people-centered, and that the people take not only their rights, that's not a democracy, it's a welfare state, but they take seriously also their obligation to themselves, to others, and the world. You know, and prosperity, prosperity, or peace. Well, 
the time you watch that, if peace is uh, not bound with your neighbor, uh, 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 also. but uh, we are at war continuously with ourselves. You know, the number of people mentally ill is staggering. Uh, the problem of uh, marit marital relationship, of uh, children mistreatment, and also, we are continuously waging war in the name of prosperity to the environment, to <laughs> human beings. Four million three hundred people are killed by air pollution every year. If that is not war, what it is? And uh, zillions species that are extinct. We always uh, see things. Uh, how we <coughs> make, can make a dollar out of that? That is not democracy, that is uh, uh, entropy. Mm. Thank you, thank you, Alberto. Third. Uh, I, I wanted just to agree with many points that you have raised, but I wanted also to contest one. And I want to begin with the statement, which might be a banal statement, but it seems to me that the most troublesome concepts are the ones that we are taking for granted. Not only because they are familiar, but simply they are embedded in the way of our thinking. And uh, I would say democracy as a concept is one of that because we sort of perceive it as a sacred cow now. The problem is, the, and I will uh, talk about that a little bit later, but for me what is uh, uh, the, the problematic is your concept that Maybe it's better to have quality of life instead of democracy. Unfortunately, the one doesn't work without another. Mm -hmm. And I will give you a very specific example, just recently. A couple of days ago, or maybe a week ago, there was a terrible fire in one of the uh, malls in Russia, in mm -hmm. Siberia. Mm -hmm. 61 people died mm -hmm. in the fire, burned in the fire. The problem was that in the cinema, the uh, fire escape doors were locked, and they could not leave. Wow. Ah, they could leave it. Was it Putin who was uh, uh, guilty for that? No, of course he did not give the, gave, give this order. He did not lock the doors, etc., etc. But the first thing the governor said when that happened was publicly. I want to thank Mr. Putin, our president, for his attention. He called me immediately to express his. Instead of saying that coming to the people who were standing in the square and talking to them, he thanked Putin. Putin, in his turn, was talking about the terrible loss of life and its, its impact on demography. Can you imagine mm. this lack of empathy in the society when he's talking not about the faith? And immediately it was an eye opener. The people were starting to shout in the square, down with Putin, down with the governor. 44 children, as I The governor know. had to, uh, to resign just yesterday. Well, in fact, what I'm saying that this was happening uh, because of the absence of democracy, because nobody re reports response to the people. The governor was not elected by the people. He was appointed by Putin, by the president. The mayor was appointed by Putin, uh, by, by the governor. And of course, they are thinking not about people, but about their boss because their future will be determined by that. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry, uh, without democracy in the usual way, there is no security, first of all. And security is a major component of the quality of life. And now I want just to say uh, just a few words about uh, my apprehension to share with you. Gary, we've, we've started uh, this uh, project uh, together on, uh, on uh, the uh, change of paradigm. It's already five years. I couldn't imagine that it has five years. 
And you know that I've been a proponent of that. I've written an article that, uh, uh, on this issue. Sorry, but I s on the verge of thinking differently about that. I'm afraid that the, there is no paradigm ch change because there is a paradigm dissolution today. There is no new paradigm. And it will never be. Because what is paradigm? It's a shared worldview which is uh, used by the majority of the people. Today, with different sources of information, with different uh, 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 you know, levels of uh, le legitimization, with the crisis of the authority, no parents are authority anymore. The professor at the university is not an authority. No one is authority today. And people are available, uh, uh, capable to <coughs> reconstruct the reality now according to their wishes. And that just leaves no space for new paradigm. And my problem is democracy has been in existence for roughly 200, 250, 200, 100 years. The way we know it is a representative democracy. I'm not taking the classical. But who told us that if it didn't exist before, it will exist forever? Maybe it has outlived its utility. And we are going into the direction where this democracy will be discontinued and we will have something else. So thank you. Thank you. Please. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to refer the, uh, to the question of uh, uh, right-wing tendency in Europe, as you mentioned. And I think we have uh, quite a lot of experience in many countries in Europe, uh, including Austria, but also Great Britain and uh, France and everywhere, yeah. all over Europe. And I think the main point is uh, beyond the question of environmental problems, which are not so important in my view in Europe, but the social situation is worsening. And the social situation is worsening not only in the uh, uh, rate of unemployment, but also the income for the poor. You know, there are so many people who work 40 hours a week and cannot afford a normal life. So this uh, situation is com uh, combined with an enormously increasing wealth accumulation on the other side. We have such a number of uh, rich people in Europe, in those countries where we have right-wing tendencies, that I think this inequality is one of the most uh, important reasons. The, the, the machinery which exists actually uh, in our governmental structures is not able to transfer this situation to the parliaments or the decision parties. Because we have many parties that are, unfortunately, I must say, social democrats in Europe. They are not transferring this different situation from 20 years ago to decisions in the parliament. So <coughs> social democrats are responsible to a large extent for this right-wing tendency in Europe. And uh, what we can do is uh, uh, to think about the machinery of uh, uh, democracy, which exists actually, that we have to go beyond voting rights. I think uh, democracy understood <coughs> as a machinery to vote for all four years. And then you go home and the government does different things in most cases what you voted before. So we should think about the minimum <coughs> income for everybody because everybody is a value in the society and this kind of minimum income or subsistence income should be integrated in the machinery of uh, 
existing governmental structures. Uh, this is a, it's very difficult, but we have, for example, in Finland, uh, also some pilot projects in how far people who get the minimum for their standard of living, if they have become lazy or not. And until now, we know that they do not become lazy. And uh, this experience in Finland is one of, uh, I think, the most important concerning the minimum income that we have in Europe. So I, I think we should uh, think in other countries also in this kind of minimum income as an additional criteria for the voting machinery which we have now. Thank you. Uh, I really love to, to discuss this uh, subject, changing, how to change the product. Alexander, I am very much under the influence of Gary. Yes, I used to speak to him that often. I would be interested to hear your, I mean, concept that maybe, maybe sure. later on. But uh, when we talk about democracy, the basic fundamental rule is freedom of speech, right? Okay, and okay, one of that's that's what what. What, uh, what, what is going on now? We everywhere, we are object to lots of propaganda, fakes, etc., etc., etc. And as Kaha, you, you talk a lot about populists. But they simply, they never listen. They only say all kind of garbage. And people who are not educated, who are not prepared, who are not developed, they are very easy to Very easy to And also, that's why education is very, very important. Of course, crucial. <laughs> That's my point as well. And what Alberta is saying is that, look, guys, so many teachers. And it's my family, to be honest, I have been doing it for, for many years. Okay. So many teachers, but so not too many people who can, who can just let this message about education, need of education, who can develop this on a very sophisticated level, who can communicate. So without sophisticated communication system of like uh, associations like, like ours, because we are we are horizontal, right? And we are based on values. What we need to do, we need to somehow to develop a system how to communicate our message on a very professional level. Otherwise we are we are suffering. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I, one second, please. Go I ahead. Think, I think one major challenge facing democracy. The next to you, sir. Democracy today and will be the case in the future is the question of how deep is democracy. You see, if it's democracy only at the national level, at a central life level, to my mind, that's a sham. And that can be manipulated. I mean, Alexander gave us the example that he quoted a while ago. So I think essentially one big challenge that we face in many countries, and particularly those which are new democracies, is to ensure that democracy percolates down to the grassroots level. Because unless the foundation is democratic, <coughs> merely having elections at the central level, at the national level, is not giving you a democratic society. So I think this is one of the big challenges which I'm afraid a lot of countries are facing and will continue to face in the future. Thank you, sir. Please. Um, the first time I'm, I to speak to I'm John Binday, for those who don't know me. I'm Vice President of Prospective 21 Hundred and former Deputy Assistant Director General of UNESCO for Social and Human Sciences and Director of Foresight at UNESCO for many years. Uh, I just wanted to intervene because I, I think that we, we should try to think, as it was said in the beginning, you know, and to think is uh, to find the links between, you see, between the things, between the concepts, the ideas, and to, and to try to move forward. And many things were mentioned, you see. You mentioned the Egyptian coup. Uh, I would just make this, uh, one comment. 
You see, this Egyptian coup is something very specific in the world today, since the military coup is the form which decreased sharply in the last decades. There are some examples in the world, Thailand, Egypt. Uh, well, there are many examples of failures, like in Turkey. Turkey, there were four military coups, which were full success between 3 and 4 a.m. in the morning. You see, and the last coup was the terrible failure. failure. In Latin America, no more. It's another thing which happens, not military coup. Even in Africa, there are less and less coup now. And, but there is a new form of coup. <coughs> It's, uh, it's, uh, I cannot uh, explain everything, but it's a, we, we could call it, you see, the civil coup. And this is a, a, a very interesting phenomenon because there is a big development of the civil coup in the world. You see, I won't give examples, but even Brazil, for example, it's a civil coup. And, uh, we know that in France because we, uh, we had some civil coup in the in history, so we are quite aware of it. And second point, you see, the issue of populism and, uh, and the situation of Europe, especially, was uh, mentioned in the discussion. And uh, we should understand uh, the major cause. If we don't understand the major cause, you see, we are going to be lost in nice talk, but not, we are not going to move forward thinking and the major cause, you see, of all that was mentioned, you see, it's globalization. The famous uh, Italian historian, Benedetto Croce, said that history is always contemporary. And you must understand how it entails the inequalities that you have mentioned, how this sharp divide within nations, within continents, and uh, uh, entails necessarily the phenomena with which we are mentioned, but I would not say populism, because populism is a very easy word. You can you put so many things in it. It's a wide pocket, and it prevents you from thinking. Because, you see, as I, I know what is extreme right, you see, I know what basically what is fascism, I know what is a radical left or what is extreme left, but populism I don't know. And but I, I know, of course, what you mean. But you take an example in France, the National Front, and I would give the same example for Italy, where the votes were very high for the National Front in France. It's quite, you can map it on a map. And you find the France which has been doomed by globalization, with deserted provinces where you cannot find a coffee shop open because everything is closed. You see, and the people are obliged to move to try to see to find a job elsewhere. Oh, they are jobless, and we are in very poor conditions. And of course, you see, there was a very strong rise of the vote from National Front. In Italy, Cinque Stelle, which is quite different from the National Front, but it is classified in this uh, so-called populist you know, uh, scheme. And Cinque Stelle, where were the high votes last elections, were in the south of Italy. You, you have a diamond here, <coughs> you can confirm, in the south of Italy, that is to say, the poor underdeveloped, or so called underdeveloped, by, 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 by uh, historic mechanism, because it's a national unity of Italy which were, was made by the north, by the wealthy north which finally uh, uh, killed the, the chance, the opportunities of the South. I, rem I remember that Gianni Battimo, the famous Italian philosopher, mentioned to me that the first, rail the first railway in Italy, where was it built? In Naples, in the South. Mm -hmm. they had, of course, they had a high level of illiteracy, but they had the best engineers, the best scientists, the best industrials, and so on. And so we, we must understand history, but if you want to move to foresight, we must first understand history. So globalization is entailing all these phenomena, including the decline of the European Union. You know, because one of the major consequences of globalization is the decline of the mechanism of regional integration. 
a commercial mess and the European Union is the best example. I cannot give you the fact that by the very explosion of the financial markets, Europe has become a dwarf, you know, compared to globalization. <coughs> and, and, and by the divide, the sharp divides and tails everywhere, you know, creating societies to see selective matching. So I will maybe speak again about that uh, the, the day I speak. So it entails all this phenomena. If we don't understand that, we are going to get lost in all the directions, and we are not going to, to, to try to set the linkage in order to try to see to develop a thinking, you know, a thinking about that. Because if not, we don't think, we just chat. Thank you. Go ahead. I'll come back to the title of this session. And it says challenges confronting democracy today. Uh, one can approach this in different ways, starting from globalization to nationalism and everything else. But in, in my opinion, there are two major issues which are confronting if democracy exists. Let's assume that it exists today. That's first world elite and second technology. That's the matter what is the democracy. Is it deep? I never heard that there is a deep democracy. I, I read about thin democracy, representative, publicity, or any sort of democracy. We know that elite is controlling them. And that's a threat to democracy. I'm not going to talk on any uh, secret or secret association with which does everything in it. But Even sometimes it's not working like this. Uh, sometimes you're not working like that. Let me just finish. You have, uh, I have a right to think uh, in my way. And even in the most democratic countries, uh, voting process, we heard is controlled. And it's controlled by elite. Everything is controlled by elite. <coughs> we might think that uh, plebs is uh, deciding how we're going to live. That's not true. As far as the technology is concerned, and confronting democracy, uh, we have a session on it, and uh, I'll discuss it, but just let me tell that human made technology with one purpose, and technology often works with completely different purpose, controlling human and controlling our lives. And I think those two issues are, if uh, we assume that democracy exists, are uh, most threats to the nations. Thank you. Thank you, sir. But I would like to refine a little bit what uh, globalization is in fact maybe uh, you know perturbing um, and creating this which is in fact what what Gary was saying at, at the introduction which was the financialization of the economy and that is a very recent uh, episode in fact finance is with us uh, for a long time but uh, uh, the finalization of, uh, uh, of the, the entire economy of, of all the economic activities is very recent and this financial control, this financial control is what is, in fact, uh, at this very moment perturbing this, this whole uh, structure that we have evolved. Um, this, uh, this financial control creates new institutions. And these institutions perturb the existing institutions. Uh, and in fact, what happens is that uh, they, they cause uh, um, this crisis of representative democracy and the loss of confidence in the existing institutions. And I'm talking about, in fact, because this, uh, this financial control is uh, a globalized financial control. I'm not saying it's global because there is not one center that controls finance, right? A sort of a it's really a complex system. We know that they all belong to each other and so on, but they, they have a globalized perspective. Whereas the, our national institutions in which uh, democracy and all other regimes uh, are supported are limited to, 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 to locals. So in fact, this, uh, it is this new institution, this financial, these institutions that were created for financial control by uh, financial capitalism or uh, informational capitalism, as, as some call, 
that in fact is perturbing the system, is perturbing ourselves, and causing this lack of institution. Because we see that the existing institutions are not responding to our, to our issues. Now, what is necessary? What is necessary is to bring back financial power to under civil power. Well, it's, it's, uh, we all laugh when we talk about mm -hmm. it. But we must not forget that the, our nation states were created when military power was brought in under civil control. So we built our nation state by, in fact, integrating military power under the, 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 the device of civil power. <coughs> So what is complicated here is the dimension, because we are talking about different dimensions here. One is national and the other one is global, global here to that extent. Uh, and this is the challenge, I think, the big challenge that, 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 we, that we face. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. There, there seems to be a prevalent view uh, that uh, populism and uh, populist movements um, in Europe and elsewhere. Um, it's one of the challenges to um, democracy now uh, confronting. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure about it. Um, yeah. What's wrong with populism? If um, populist movements or uh, populist demands if they don't, one condition, if they don't deny the rights of others. I mean, if you say that, for example, in order to resolve um, unemployment problem in Austria, um, we need to kick out one million foreigners. And those foreigners are Austrian citizens, by the way. They've been living for their generations. The lady, I your higher you have to say, we have one million unemployed people and one million migrants. So, so this is the denial of others. Unless populist movements um, do not deny the others, what's wrong with it? I'll tell you, That's okay, my yeah. question. Yes, please. Uh, yeah. I, I agree with all of, uh, of us who raise the problem of uh, understanding what uh, we are talking about or what uh, one of us is talking about, and, and especially when we speak about democracy. Therefore, I would uh, uh, suggest that we clearly uh, define at least the, 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 the frame in which we are using with the democracy as it's uh, I, I, I would also like to stress from method methodological aspect that when we speak about uh, democracy on national level, it's not the same thing in each state. Because in Egypt, the, as we use democracy as a, as a, as a way or as a, as a way in which people influence the decisions, then uh, this direct democracy type, uh, we, we heard about how to change the, the ruler, is uh, in a certain country. Uh, welcome and accept it. Of course, I will stress the procedures and the forms in which such uh, people will is uh, is uh, expressed, as we know, in a, in a so-called uh, established or uh, or or the past of democracies. Uh, we are facing also the other problem of uh, cost of such a democracy uh, because it is costly. The other problem, we are speaking about challenges, is, is various type of instrumentalization of 
procedures and the people will through the procedures of of, uh, of expressing such a will. That is also a problem because, uh, as we know, I, I'm speaking about the my national experience, and I, I am aware of the other, that the confidence in uh, politics as such, and people who are, who are uh, involved in such activity, is going lower. So it is, uh, it is not a rare case that in, in established democracy, we have the legitimization of, uh, of voters in a, in a minor, in a minor numbers, usually 20% of population uh, uh, votes, and it, it is accepted on this one because of the procedures. Uh, therefore, uh, I would uh, also put the accent that the definition or how we look to the democracy uh, must be shifted. Uh, from the procedures, oh, they, they are, they are tools, but must be shifted towards the values or standards that are acceptable, whether on national or on global or global scale. And the last one, that when we speak democracy in a global scale, in a, in a global uh, scale, it also must be uh, expressed uh, in, in uh, globally accepted, uh, globally accepted uh, values or standards. That is thank you. Thank you, sir. John Bunsell, I'm the founder of the International Simultaneous Policy Organization, which is a, um, a citizens' um, movement to uh, drive nations toward global agreements on uh, climate change, on uh, re-regulating financial markets, and so forth. Um, I just wanted to echo what uh, Jerome and Zhao were saying, that, that and, and also in, in an educational sense, if we, we need education, what we need is education to think systemically and globally about the problems. If we connect all the dots, as uh, Jerome and Zhao were saying, the symptoms we're talking about, the symptoms we're concerned about are symptoms, and they are symptoms of, of effectively now a, a global economy with globally free moving capital, but governance which is only national, or mainly national. And you, you can never have uh, freedom and democracy and sustainability uh, in an economy you have, to have, you have to have governance on the same scale as the economy you're trying to govern. It's no good having a global economy without some form of global cooperative governance. Um, the, the, and I just wanted to sort of further precise a little bit what, what, what you were saying is, is also for us to recognize the language of what I call this, it's almost a dictatorship. It's not of any person, but it's, it's like a dynamic of global, what I call destructive global competition. This is simply the ability of globally mobile entities, be they markets, multinational corporations, capital, to move globally. And they are, will always win at the expense of whatever is nationally rooted, like governments, mm -hmm. poor, the environment. And the, the language that is used, whenever you hear we the words, we must keep our nation internationally competitive. That is the language of the dictatorship that we all wonder. Uh, and it's no, there's no person behind it. It's a, it's a dynamic. And, and to my mind, we're a little bit sitting now at a stage where, which is a little bit perhaps like the middle of the late Middle Ages in, in, in Europe before the the, the, someone was saying, well, you know, uh, everyone is trading all around Europe. You know, we need something called the nation state. And, and probably the other person in the pub said, oh, forget it, that will never happen. You know, and, and now here we are with nation states. And, and now we're at the next stage where the economy is now global, and we're, we're, talk we're talking about some kind of global cooperation, and people say, oh, that will never happen. But you know what? It's going to have to happen if we're 
can survive in any civilized sense. And if democracy and, and, and the evolution of governance in, in the individual states is to, is to sort of develop and evolve in a, in a healthy trajectory, although in every nation, of course, it's different and, and so forth. So, I just wanted to, to highlight this idea of, of the language that has been used for international competitiveness. We always think, oh, well, that's a good thing if we're competitive. But you know what? That's the thing that's actually killing us all. Mm -hmm. Slowly, subtly. So, so we need to just understand the systemic, and that's where I think education really uh, can, can really play a role. Is how do we think globally and systemically? You know, rather than, you know, instead of thinking nation centrically, we need to think world centrically. Thank you, sir. Could a uh, really democratic uh, country, society, survive in the non-democratic world? Because we don't see this, this big challenge that's stemming from uh, empires uh, built uh, upon the dictatorship, like in China, for instance, with the invasion of the global economy, with cheap stuff that was produced, but labor, uh, the, that working like slaves and uh, then creating the superpower, uh, endangering the United States economy. So now they have the bargaining and political power that is equal to previous uh, empire, economic empires. The same, the next uh, example that is totally different is, is Russia. Uh, uh, do the democrat democracies uh, have such an ability to very fast reactions to external dangers? In Russia, they have uh, Shoigu and the Ministry of, uh, ex uh, of uh, Extraordinary uh, Events or something like that. So they have... Uh, well, Shoigu is now the Minister of Defense, if I'm not mistaken. But before was he was, he was like that. Yeah, but, but they are the, really the fast uh, moving forces to react uh, in any places when there is an inflammation. So uh, democracy uh, in the EU is uh, being disintegrated. So the question is whether we are not coming back to La Fontaine when the wolf asks uh, the lamb, uh, I, want to, uh, I want to eat you, the announcer not asks. Uh, and the lamb asks, uh, why? Because you are small, alone, and in the forest. Yeah. So uh, how we are getting you know, stronger, how we, uh, how we combine our forces, uh, what are the platforms of combining our strengths instead of uh, playing grounds and uh, uh, trying to compete internally? It's coming. It's coming. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just to, if I could just comment on one or two of the points that have been made this morning. We said earlier that democracy suffered from the, the straitjacket of being uh, confined to being a counterpoint to totalitarian socialisms. Now, Fadwa mentioned the fact that nations that cannot follow democracy will not get IMF loans. That is another contributing factor to the neglect of a proper widespread public examination of what democracy is because it's, the term is labeled has been abused. Uh, the use of democracy in that case by the IMF meant democracy means open markets. And that meant the social equi economic equivalent of asking nations to open their legs and accept rape. So that's, there are two things as the, the use of democracy to counterpoint socialist terror, uh, totalitarianisms and its, and, and its abuse, um, a major factor in our not understanding what democracy is and there being no uh, broad international consensus. Mr. Tsukuni has said democracy starts at home. Of course it does. Democracy is not top down, it is bottom up. It can only be bottom up. Eric spoke of the rising inequality. Now, this is a symptom of ongoing systemic failure. And unless we get that clear, the, once we've reformed the system, the inequality will begin to disappear. What's wrong with populism as long it, as it does no harm, asked Nuri. Well, the trouble with populism is that it's ideological. And what's wrong with ideological? Well, the American philosopher Marilyn Robinson said this, ideological thinking is thinking that by definition is not one's own, which is blind to experience and the contradictions that arise when broader fields of knowledge are consulted. 
It is capitulation. It is a capitulation no one should ever make. That's what's wrong with populism, basically. And finally, I very much want to endorse Zhao's comment about what happened to military power being brought under citizen control or democratic oversight or <coughs> not. The same thing must happen with financial power. It must be brought under democratic citizen control and oversight. That's the problem. They've done it with arms, or they haven't done it with arms. They've tried to. We now have to try and do it with money. Thank you. Thank you. Atelina, if I'm not mistaken, you can talk to stay. Good afternoon. I'm Kathleen Walker. Um, I'm a WASP fellow. Uh, my background is different from most people here in that I worked more in the area of democratic education since 1984. In 1983, the first country that I went to from the U.S. was the Soviet Union, the then Soviet Union, and we managed as students. Uh, just graduated to speak to some fellow students and they, they didn't give us a lot of freedom to have these conversations but it was sufficiently enough conversations to have to be inspired by their at that point love for freedom or what they thought also our, our Levi's jeans and some of our music which they wanted um, there was a materialist as well. <coughs> so in 1984 I started working with the National Endowment for Democracy in which was newly formed to promote democracy in open ways, not in, in secret ways. And there were four institutes, there still are. Two worked with political parties, and one with trade unions, and one with um, uh, chamber of commerce. So fast forward to the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, uh, cold, the end of the Cold War, I won't say the fall. Um, we had a, a brief um, training session there, and we worked with public associations briefly, which were youth groups, NGO equivalents. I never saw the people who I saw in 1983 again, but what was so interesting then is what a mystery then freedom was. And when we talked about democracy and we talked about freedom, which we were invited to do, then it was a very fearful conversation at that point. Mm. And, and the, the concept of freedom was very new, and in fact, we were incredibly naive when I look back at, at the kind of training that we did. But over the years, we've worked, I've worked in several transitional democracies, and now, even now, I find myself, when we were speaking about the achievements of democracy, and I promised Xiao we would, I would think of an achievement, because it's so easy to focus on all the shortcomings. Uh, one achievement that occurred to me as we were sitting here uh, I know Jer Gary, I was in South Africa, the workshop they held in May um, last year, and I don't think I said a single word for, for two days or three days. And one of the, the achievements now amongst us, I think, is none of us will return to our homes, to our countries, to our universities, and be locked up and taken away to jail. Um, I hope not. But it, it, in some of the countries where I lived, I'm still a bit wavery about speaking because we weren't able, some of the countries where there were transitions, Egypt and, and, and a lot of different places we were, uh, we actually promoted the ideals. It was, we were naive in some ways. There's the aspects which you can be very skeptical about. But uh, to go back to, to the challenges of democracy, I think now the freedom that we have, all of us here, one, I, I'm now in South Africa. I've been there since 1993, and I went there to work on the elections when Mandela was eventually elected. And now we have a new president, as Gary was alluding to, who became president in, in the last six weeks because our previous president was very corrupt, and he was finally removed uh, by the ruling party. It was with resignation, but not quite. But that was democracy in process. And we're talking about democracy. Obviously, democracy is a process. It's not one day, just like they used to do in our training. The elections are not one day, they're a process. But uh, I, I think now our own freedom uh, in the United States, where I'm originally from, I, I feel almost like it's being weaponized against us in a certain way. 
people say data is being weaponized. I think our own freedom, it's, it's like a bad novel almost. People discovered all of our loopholes in freedom, and now they're, they're using them. And we used to hold democracy conferences all over the world, and we also almost joke, well, the dictators are probably all meeting together and holding dictatorship conferences, and they're talking about ways to, to use our own strengths or our, our own freedoms against us. And I feel like here, it's a wonderful opportunity to talk. I don't work in this field anymore. I'm now working in entrepreneurship and education and edutech because I realize that democracy, if you can deliver, you can de deliver a ballot uh, paper, even though that, as the gentleman said, can be very good that now elections are victims to technology. But if you don't have the economic freedom that accompanies it, or the economic opportunity, or the access to opportunity, then the democracy won't, it won't last. It will, be, it will be stolen away one way or the other. So I'm now not working in this field at all. So my title here has nothing to do actually with what I do uh, now, but I was so concerned about what was happening in the world, especially in the last 12 months, I decided to come back. And we are developing education programs, mostly through social media. So maybe some of this will be will be woven in. Before we move to say that it would be very dubious to agree that democracy is a process bottom up. It's at least top down. But that's another question. Why what did you say? I'm expecting actually to say that confronting democracy is a climate change probably the real issue today. The most real issue is a climate change confronting democracy today. Thank you. I think the real challenge of democracy is to protect the global commons in the future. Climate change is a part of that. We are ruining this planet. And democracy has been an accessory in ruining this planet. So I think that's a huge challenge, which I think all of us yeah, must possible. I have a question for Fadwa and a question for Alberto and Professor Victor. Uh, the question for Fadwa is, um, I'm uncertain what the consequence was of the Arab Spring. Okay, did she answer on the, on the large brain? Or no, 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 I just, this is the question I wanted to put. Okay? <laughs> And then with regard to, Alberto raised a very important question which I haven't adequately discussed and I want to just briefly mention. Uh, he, he raised the question fundamentally of what is the truth upon which democracy is based? How do you sustain that truth? How do you make it workable? Now, uh, this came out originally in the 19th century when Holmes said the best test of truth was the capacity of thought to have itself accepted in the competition of the market. He said that was the only basis upon which American democracy was based. Fast forward 100 years to Bush, 9-11. 9-11, they couldn't find anything in the UN Charter that related to the problem of attacks on terrorism. They therefore concluded that there were no rules governing the United States position on terrorism. Well, I wrote to the legal advisor challenging this, gave, giving him an interpretation of the self-defense clause in the Charter, and uh, I got a response. He thanked me, he said, we'll use some of it. I don't know how much of it they actually used because they had black sites which tortured people. But it was his last paragraph that struck me. He said, in any event, the question of truth is what we say truth is. And all we have to do is to repeat it endlessly and we will establish a new truth, the new truth being there are no rules that constrain us on this war against terrorism. Okay, on that note, I think Sorry. we will end, but I would like to just um, say how, uh, I mean, I, when I was uh, invited to participate, I said, oh no, here we go again, democracy. And then invited to moderate, oh, that's an administrative, but it's so exciting to be here. I mean, my brain cells are hopping with all your ideas. So thank you very much.